And, you know, the other piece that I, I, I said to um, some colleagues a couple of weeks ago, I said that um, students come to our respective small college campuses expecting perfection. Mm. And when they don't get it, they're disappointed, mm -hmm. right? And they expect perfection and they expect us to deliver um, that to them because the world is imperfect. Mm -hmm. So I think there's even more pressure uh, on our small colleges to be able to do that. And so the future of student affairs, um, particularly at the um, at various levels, um, is, is what do we do about that? Mm -hmm. uh, what do we do about that and maintain the trust and maintain yeah. an adequate workforce, all of those other things? I think it's just gonna get harder. Hello, and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host, Keith Edwards. Today, we're discussing student affairs at small colleges. This is near and dear to my heart. I attended a small college, Hamlin University. And I spent eight years working in another small college, McAllister College. I'm excited to have the editors of a new book on student affairs at small colleges, Small and Mighty, here to discuss. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and online learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find details about this episode or browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. Today's episode is sponsored by Simplicity, a true partner. Simplicity supports all aspects of student life with technology platforms that empower institutions to make data-driven decisions. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Keith Edwards. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a speaker, consultant, and coach. You can find out more about me at keithedwards.com. I'm broadcasting from Minneapolis, Minnesota, at the intersections of the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. Let's get to our conversations uh, and meet our guests. Tom, let's go ahead and start with you. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Shanley, him, her, him, him, <laughs> he, him, excuse me. Um, I am uh, currently retired uh, from the world of student affairs and in academic search as the one of the senior consultants recruiting primarily in student affairs. Um, prior to that though, I spent 41 years in student affairs work, 31 years as a chief student affairs officer at three different private colleges. Great, glad you're here, Krista. Hello everyone, my name is Krista Porter. I use she, her pronouns, and I have the pleasure of serving as our associate dean of our graduate college and my academic home is as an associate professor in our higher ed administration and student affairs program here at Kent State. And I am so uh, excited to be connected to my colleagues mm -hmm. through my work as a doctoral student working at small colleges and universities. And I'm sure I'll be able to share a little bit more later, but that's how I come into the conversation. Great, wonderful. And my, my neighbor, Carolyn. <laughs> I am your neighbor, uh, Keith. Uh, Carolyn Livingston. Uh, I am the Vice President for Student Life uh, and Dean of Students uh, here at Carleton College uh, in Northfield, Minnesota. Uh, Keith and I happen to be a little less than an hour um, from each other, and so it, it's such a pleasure uh, to be here with him uh, and talk about something as well, uh, as Krista just iterated, that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, the small college um, and, and student affairs. And so happy to be with, with all of you today. Uh, wonderful. Well, let's jump into it. You've edited this book. Uh, e each of you wrote some parts and you had a lot of contributors, including our own Manta Akapati and other wonderful folks. Um, but for folks who are less familiar with small colleges, how is student affairs work different at small colleges? And are there any myths you would like to dispel? Uh, Carolyn, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, you know, Keith, I think that being at one, a small college and a university uh, is, is an amazing thing. Um, I will uh, say that I did not begin my uh, professional career uh, at a small college, neither was I educated uh, at a small mm -hmm. college as well. Uh, but there's something special about the work that we do here, the type of students uh, that we impact. Uh, and as a senior student affairs officer, the high touch high impact work um, uh, that we do on a daily basis. Uh, it is uh, nothing to say that uh, we really do our best and often um, are able to touch base and talk with every student uh, on our respective campuses. Being on these campuses 
you know, small colleges span 5,000, but many of our campuses are less than 2,000. So we are small colleges, we high touch impact, uh, where we connect with not only um, our students, uh, but we connect as well, uh, very well with our faculty and staff. Um, and I do believe that um, being at a small college as well, that we are actively engaged in the life and mind of the college uh, in ways that other um, uh, folks can experience uh, at, at bigger places. And so um, near near and dear to my near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. I really resonate with that. I mean, I, my experience as a student was I knew a lot of people and was known by a lot of people. And my experience as a staff member was being able to know just about all of the faculty members by name. And and it always felt like I knew just about all of the students uh, by name by the time they were graduating. I can't imagine that was actually true given the numbers in my memory, but it felt like I did. And that was a really wonderful thing. Tom, you were at three different um, small private campuses you mentioned. What would you like to add? Well, I, I guess I want to say um, that I'd be, that my college experience was at a small college um, in Iowa. And I, so I grew up both around a college campus as well as attended the same institution, mm -hmm. some college. And, and I, you know what? I got to know all the folks in student affairs early on, which was a real stimulus for me to consider that work. Um, but having then served as the chief student affairs officer at those institutions, I, I think I'd echo what Carolyn had to say, but I, I think one of the things that was uh, mind, I kept, kept track of the entire time I was there and was very mindful of, and that is because we make so many decisions every day that affect the lives of students directly at a small college. Uh, it's it's an enormous responsibility uh, and an enormous pleasure. Uh, I, it's impossible to walk across campus <laughs> as the dean and not have almost every student know who you are. Um, I had done my under my graduate work at the University of Minnesota, so you know this well, Keith. I mm -hmm. suspect. Walking across campus, you could you could completely be invisible. <laughs> From that to a, a campus of fifteen hundred, where it was exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. I guess the last thing I would say is, while relationships are important everywhere, uh, as colleges are absolutely vital uh, to to develop effective relationships with faculty, with other staff, uh, with student leaders. Uh, it's all about that, and that's how things work. Um, much more, I think, than the two large public institutions that I had previously worked at. You asked us to reflect on myths, and I, mm -hmm. um, um, I think there's a myth that because we're at a small college, uh, it's less complex. Uh, work might even be less demanding, and of course, it's probably just the opposite of that. Uh, we're pretty much on day and night. Uh, you know, we we don't have the the scores of staff below us, so we're very likely to get those late night calls. Mm -hmm. uh, the crisis, uh, it's not ever. Um, I don't think less complex. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was sort of, sort of thinking about at, maybe at a larger campus, there's more of a stay in your lane. This is your role. Everybody else has their other things. We're at a small campus. There's exactly. less like our lanes are all crisscrossing all the time. There, there isn't that. Um, Krista, what, what would you add? I think just to build on what you just said, Keith, it's um, so as a doctoral student, I was able to get, I uh, went to University of Georgia for my, for my doctorate, but because of proximity to Atlanta and Decatur, I was able, and because I just got to meet Carolyn, mm -hmm. um, I got to serve at both Agnes Scott and Emory. And an ex a specific example about the sort of crossing lanes is I remember we were in an assessment planning meeting that Carolyn let me sit in and the amount of collaboration that was happening right before my eyes. It didn't matter about titles. It didn't matter about positions. Everyone was at the table. Everyone, it, and it was a lot of people, right? And so this full committee of different folks from across campuses all had a say. Uh, all voices were heard. And all were able to contribute to this this document, right? Mm -hmm. This plan, the strategic plan. And so I think that's an example of the intent, the intention, 
um, and the collaboration that happens at a small college, specifically in student affairs divisions. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. Keith, I can sort of piggyback on Krista's point uh, and also um, blend something, you know, that Tom shared. You know, when you talk about relationships, uh, it's not only um, faculty and staff. Um, and students, but I think in particular at a small college, it's the parents and the families. Mm. Um, it's the it's the alumni, uh, but it's also you know small college often equates to small town, mm. um, and and so the visibility uh, that the dean or the senior student affairs has officer has in the community uh, is extremely important. Mm. Um, and you know if there are things happening in the town. Um, Community members, when I go into the grocery store in my, or when I go into the local store, they are likely to say, hey, I saw a student doing this or I saw some students at the, you know, the local coffee shop, uh, all these types of things. And so it's the relationships that exist beyond the people that we see on our campuses uh, every day. And I think that's critical for the for the small college. Yeah. And I love that 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 no know, knowing and, and being known. It's a double-edged sword, right? There's a, to, to me, that was fantastic. My daughter, who's 13, the idea of being on a small campus where everybody would know her, she's like, why would you want that? <laughs> oh, I, that sounds terrible. And so I think it's not, um, you know, it, for, for different folks. And I think that goes with, we're student affairs professionals. I think there are some people who really want, like, like you're talking about, this really direct student impact and student influence much more of a retail sort of like knowing them, talking with them, meeting with them. And others much prefer a much more indirect, more wholesale approach at a larger institution where you're having an indirect impact on maybe larger folks. And I think I uh, really appreciate you laying some of that out. I think one of the fun me, things, go, go ahead, Tom. Uh, well, let me just, I think, jump in on one thing we didn't mention that I think is is critically important at small colleges. And that's the that's the importance of staff development. Um, for, for small colleges, either because of uh, limitations in resources or the lack of mobility uh, in, in terms of professional development and moving up, mm -hmm. you know, the importance of doing staff development on campus for your staff, or if you're able to support staff development by attending professional conferences is really important. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I say that because for so many of uh, of the staff that we were responsible for, they can't, they probably won't get promoted. <laughs> you know, there's just not the same possibilities there that you might find at a large public, for instance. Um, and so to keep them vital, to keep them energized, to, to allow them to grow, focusing on that development, providing resources for that is probably more important than ever at a small college. Right. I think one of the fun things about editing a book is that you begin editing because you have something to say and you have some expertise and knowledge and someone deemed you able to edit and then you get all these contributors and you read and you learn so much along the way i'd like to invite each of you to share what is uh, a learning for you that you gained through this experience through through your own writing and reading what the contributors offered krista what did you learn first of all let me give uh, shout outs to these amazing people, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Tom and please. Carolyn, it was such a pleasure to work alongside them and to think with them, to tackle issues with them, right? To, to go through chapters with them. One thing that I learned in the process, because I too, similar to what Carolyn shared, have been educated at large publics um, and have worked at large publics. And so for me, the ability to engage so many institutions Right. So the diversity of institutions that are considered small colleges, 5000 or less students. Um, and so to work with some of these authors who are coming from all different pathways into small colleges and universities, um, various titles, uh, most of the authors were at the senior level. But uh, that is one thing that I particularly learned is the the diversity among institutions, private, public, small, um, right, liberal arts, HBCU, minority serving, right? And so uh, I, I walk away with that. Awesome. How about you, Tom? What did you learn through this? Well, I, I kind of want to echo something Krista just said, and that is that it, it really was, uh, I think, humbling and, and also exhilarating to see so much talent out there mm. you know talented people 
writing these chapters with multiple experiences. You know, some were distinctive, certainly uh, distinctive by type of institution, uh, by by resources, um, by culture. But there are also many similar similarities between people that uh, find passion in the work that they do at the small college, whether public or private. So I think that was one of the things that was uh, like Krista. I learned a lot. You know, I learned a lot from others who uh, willingly contributed. I think the other thing that there were differences, and the differences that that I think are critical as we uh, face the future and as people try to cope with what's going on now is there's a pretty good gap um, between the resourced institutions that might be considered more elite mm -hmm. and the capacity to, to hire staff and to hire new staff and to develop programs and those that frankly are struggling to make, make ends meet, uh, to get enrollment, to get a, to get a student population that um, is necessary to, to stay productive. And, and so that's apparent. And so some of the some of the things that we through this would be different based on those cultural and resource differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I think one of the things that I I've observed in my work working with many different institutions, this goes beyond small colleges, is the 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 pre pre COVID institutions that were thriving are doing great. <laughs> They're thriving even more. And the pre-COVID yeah. institutions that were struggling are struggling more than ever. And I think Ebony mm -hmm. Zamani Gallagher said, you know, the, the prediction on COVID is the rich will get richer, the poor will get poorer. And I, I think about all the time as I see that. Is that something that you're noticing too? Um, mm -hmm. the, the most selective institutions are having banner years and applications and students living on campus and resources and and the ones that were struggling are, are are struggling more than ever. I think that's absolutely right. Mm. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a piece, uh, Keith, um, in a, a chapter that I um, uh, wrote with Steve Poskanzer, who's the um, president emeritus uh, here in Carleton, where we talk about that that the the search for distinction, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 particularly what is it about the small college. Um, that makes it unique. Uh, where's the niche, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because as you indicated, um, you know, there are some institutions that did very well um, um, during the COVID or were able to continue um, sort of that um, um, continue, continue thriving. Uh, but there were a couple of institutions that were really struggling um, prior to COVID, um, and some have shut down. Um, mm -hmm. There's an institution or two that we mentioned, say, you know, they survived the Civil War, but couldn't survive COVID um, mm -hmm. when, they're, when, they're, yeah. when, when the numbers um, went down um, significantly. But I think that's what we learned um, as well from the authors and, and the contributors, right? We learned that people um, do the best that they can um, at the small college to keep it going. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's either from a, um, a financial standpoint, that's either from a resource sort of reduction, maximizing um, staff, um, being extremely resor resourceful for how we um, how we care for uh, students and or provide mm -hmm. for some provide for students pretty much in, in ways that are extraordinary um, mm -hmm. at, at, at small colleges. And um, so so I think. That's a part of what I learned from the authors uh, and the contributors. I and mean, mind you, it was 33, 34 of them, right? Mm -hmm. who, who all had individual um, or different backgrounds. Some we knew a lot about, others we were pleasantly, we were pleasantly surprised. Um, I think the other piece, uh, Keith, that I'll mention uh, that I that I learned is that um, senior student affairs officers have various pieces of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, and and they showed that like you know we had someone who we thought in mind you know could write about uh, freedom of, of of expression right um, and then it was like no put me you know on another a, another section and so mm -hmm. the things that the folks who work at small colleges and universities need to know and actually know um, just make them all the more special for working at these respective institutions. Right. I, I wonder if you could talk to me about um, 
community building. Uh, and, and this is something that's standing out to me from what you're just talking about, but also what you said earlier about um, when colleges are struggling, not only do we need to you know, maximize staff time and, and, and manage the budgets, but there's also a desire to build community to bring in a class and build community to foster retention and build community, keep the alumni engaged and donating. And um, how is community building uh, a critical part of this at the small colleges? You, as you've all pointed to, there's the, the relationships and the connection and being known. How is that playing a role in, in sort of institution viability? One of our, in the chapters that, uh, I think it's chapter seven, chapter six, where it's talking about uh, managing COVID, mm -hmm. um, the authors talked with several VP, uh, VPSAs around the country at small colleges. And that was one thing that really they highlighted was the ability to build community across levels. So mm -hmm. to assist the students, to support the students, to work with each other, um, to really pull folks in at all levels uh, because the task was was great, mm -hmm. right? And so how are folks building community? How are folks communicating with each other? How are folks getting buy-in about decisions that had to be made on, on right there? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, that's, what, that's what made me think of that as you asked that question is specifically that chapter around COVID. Mm -hmm. There's also- strikes me. Oh, go, for it. go ahead, Carolyn. No, no you go, Tom. Well, just what strikes me in, in thinking about the question you just posed, Keith, is, is leadership's more important than ever um, on these campuses. It's, and and it's, it's, it's the president, it's the vice presidents, it's the deans, it's people really, really focusing on, particularly post-COVID, the importance of developing community, of, pe of people coming together, shared planning, shared celebrations, um, acknowledging the hard work that people are doing. Uh, I, I think it's probably more critical now than ever. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's more critical. And I think that there is also a higher set of expectations for community building, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think now the uh, when we talk about higher education and really when we talk about the world, now we're talk pre-COVID and, and post-COVID, right? Mm -hmm. And and whatever this post-COVID world that we're in, um, is living really, with COVID, right? exactly dealing with yeah. COVID. Uh, I think the expectations are even higher uh, because I think that there is a period that folks missed out on, or folks were, or a period where people weren't actually able to capitalize on the community. So um, so to echo Tom, I think there's even more of an expectation um, that we build community and um and you know particularly at a small college there's always an opportunity to 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 build community but in in many ways we have to be even more intentional mm -hmm. uh, a, a, about that either mm -hmm. from a how do we put faculty staff and students in space with each other mm -hmm. um how do we provide the events and the programs and the services that do that as well? Some targeted outreach to particular populations that might feel disengaged from a community perspective. I think we have to be aware of all of that even more so now than we did before. And community building, you know, Keith, uh, is core of what we do at the small college. Right. Do you see a, a greater uh, need for that? I guess my my assumption is because of covid because of isolating and social distancing and masking and 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 missing out on school that the the need and desire for community is greater than ever and the skill and capacity to make connections to build friendships to build relationships is lower than ever and then that that might lead to a um rather than the students doing that they they want Student affairs. <laughs> right. we, we want community. We're having a hard time. Will you please do that for us? We'd like to maybe think about with us. Do you see that dynamic? Absolutely. I mean, I I think you you were in a meeting yesterday with us yesterday um, <laughs> here at Carlton talking exactly um, about that. Uh, and and we can we can um, attribute. Um, the the challenge that our students are having with communication and dialogue 
uh, to a to a lot of things, right? Yeah. Um, the the increased use of of technology, um, the the whole Zoom environment, um, what whatever the case may be. Right. Um, but um, but I I think again, it's even it's even more challenging. Uh, to to be able to do so, and we really have to balance those tensions, as you indicated, between the students who um, want us to let to do less, but really they want us to do more. Uh, mm -hmm. They want us to help them find a friend or find friends. Um, their parents want um, when they call us at the small college, they say, "Hey, you know." My son Keith is having challenges uh, right now in um, in in connecting with you know their roommate um, and and meeting and meeting friends. Can you help them without you telling them that I've called uh, to do so? And those are the types of community building events that we have to community building things that we have to continue to do um, at at the small college. And I know Tom you know, did a tremendous job of of, of, of that at, at Davidson for such a long time. Well, I, I see, and I wonder, Tom, if you've experienced this, where where you so many students know you, um, and when you are putting in boundaries, they want you to leave us alone. What are you doing? <laughs> let us be, let us be, let us be. You have no right, right? And then when they need you, why aren't you here? Why, why don't you stop them? Why don't you prevent this from happening? Did, did you experience that kind of tension? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that I think you hit, you hit something on the head. I think there it, it's knowing when to step in and when to step away. That's, that's a critical kind of balance uh, that we all have to navigate all the time. And, you know, I, I'll give you an example of, of student government. You know, I made a decision early on at, at both of the institutions I was at that I would get that I would spend my time getting to know the student government leaders and being a part of their meetings and their time even if they hadn't had that with, from the dean before critically important relationship it probably helped us get a lot of the things accomplished around policy development and student engagement uh, because of some trust that you could develop um, on the other hand Leadership changes every year. <laughs> you know, sometimes they want that, and sometimes that's the last thing they want. Mm -hmm. and you have to be able to ebb and flow with that, and realize that um, the generations of students also have different needs as they come in, and yeah. different feelings about administrators and older adults, and 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 so if you can't if you can't be flexible, you probably can't survive. Yeah. Well, I love to. Get you. You spent all this time uh, writing, editing, putting this book out, talking about it with others. Um, I'd like to get your expert prognostications. What do you see ahead for the future of student affairs at small colleges? What do you What do you see in that crystal ball? Tom, let's start with you. Um, I'm going to say a couple of things, but I want I want the folks here on the boots on the ground right now. This is some of their 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 wonder. Um, you know, I'll go back to something that I think is going to have a monumental impact on student affairs, and that's that's the uh, differential enrollments patterns, uh, because that drives resources, that drives revenue, that drives hard choices at small companies um, about how to spend their money. And while and that constant tension will always lean towards academic affairs, as it should, um, the student affairs also plays a terribly vital role in both the attracting of students and the retaining of students and the, the development of a campus life. So that tension, I think, is going to get exasperated in the future. And that's, that's I hate to start with a negative, mm -hmm. but it's going to be uh, it then critically important that we go back to some themes we talked about before, the importance of relationships and the importance of trust and of building community with not just students, but faculty, um, so they can appreciate the value of what we do every day. Uh, that's that's one, um, I think, you know, one of the, the great challenges for student affairs work, um, for all student affairs, whether large or small, is, is the fewer numbers of, of students going into graduate school and to graduate prep programs. Mm -hmm. So change the dynamic of what we're able to do in terms of recruitment. And 
typically the, the larger institutions can grab a lot of those people because they have more money to spend or they, or they become more attractive or for whatever reason. And I think it may well change the model of how we approach student affairs work. Wow. Uh, we've had the luxury for quite some time of hiring professionals from master's degree programs or PhD programs and bringing them right onto our campuses in various roles. I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that fully in the future. And we may have to look at either other kinds of graduate programs or even heaven forbid, consider that maybe a bachelor's degree and some relevant student leadership experience uh, as an undergraduate might have to be acceptable. So mm -hmm. I, I think unless things change and there's nothing that indicates it's going to anytime in the near future, those are gonna be some great, great challenges for I think student affairs work. Yeah, thanks for that. Krista, what do you see? Yeah, I. Definitely um, jumping right from where Tom left off is sitting in, right, as Associate Dean of Graduate College, we definitely see those numbers decreasing, right, of our graduate students and those who are able to go into uh, these type of um, professions and sort of frontline, you know, entry level positions. I think the past few years um, has taught us a lot, right, and whether folks engage those lessons um, I think it's going to be really crucial. So whether it's COVID, whether it's racial unrest, whether it's right reproductive rights, all of these sorts of things that have come um, into the public, right? Not saying that they haven't been happening for a long time, um, but uh, it's going to test, right? I think how we have yet to see the effects, the long-term effects of some of these culture wars, if you will, right? Legislative policies, all of these things, Um but I think it's going to affect how our students come in wanting value, um, knowing their value, um, mm. you know, um, needing mental health assistance, all of these types of things. Um, I think it's going to affect um, particularly at the small college and institutional level. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the mental health is a real a particular challenge. And this goes back to a point that Carolyn made is that, I hear from all of the campuses, <laughs> uh, the mental health issues have not grown, they have grown exponentially. Um, and I think it's a unique challenge when you are a, a small college, particularly in a small town, where you don't have the wraparound resources of mental health facilities, county crisis, um, nonprofits, agencies, services, and the campus becomes sort of the the one-stop shop for all of that. It seems like that's going to put an increasing demand, particularly on folks who don't have a large municipality and all the things that come with that in addition to the campus resources. I, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. I mean there um you know there's a really interesting um article uh in the in the inside higher ed uh that talks about um uh mental health and the expectable versus the unmanageable mm -hmm. um, discomfort um, um, that just came out um, today. Um, and uh, really, what is it that we are um, sharing with our students, um, with our really talented young people about, um, is, it, is it anxiety or is it discomfort? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what role, and I think what we'll have to reconcile with uh, here at our respective campuses is um, how can we help? Um, how can we truly indeed help on um, on, a, on an issue that's global um, and everyone's sort of struggling with? Um, um, is there anything unique uh, that we can do um, on our on our respective campuses? I mean, so much so, um, Keith, that we um, just launched a, a mental health, a student mental health um, task force um here on campus to uh, to tackle that issue. Our last one was five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but we are we're we're back at it. Um, we're back at it again. And and so that sort of leads me to 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 think about when we when we you know when we talk about sort of the future of student affairs um, at small colleges, the prioritization of our work is going to be even more important now um, than, than ever. You know, Tom sort of talks about it in the sense of um, the future of our profession uh, and how do we um, bring along people um, who have a deep interest um, in, 
in our work from their own sort of student experiences? How do we bring them into the fold? Um, I think it's I think it's a really challenging thing that we have to talk about um, as a as a profession. I think our work, um, uh, frankly, is going to be a whole lot more um, of of the same um, and um, a, a whole lot more of the same in the sense of we will continue to have high expectations. We will continue uh, to have um, students who want us to engage them even more um, than 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 ever before. So high high touch, um, high impact, solve the world's problems. Um, and you know the other piece that I I, I said to um, some colleagues a couple of weeks ago, I said that. Um, students come to our respective small college campuses expecting perfection. Mm. And when they don't get it, they're disappointed, mm -hmm. right? And they expect perfection and they expect us to deliver um, that to them because the world is imperfect. Mm -hmm. So I think there's even more pressure uh, on our small colleges to be able to do that. And so the future of student affairs um, particularly at the um, at various levels, um, is is what do we do about that? Mm -hmm. uh, what do we do about that? And maintain the trust, and maintain yeah. an adequate workforce. All of those other things. I think it's just going to get harder. Yeah, and well, it really strikes me that you're saying you know students want more, expect more, need more. Um, and then our previous conversation was, you know, enrollment dropping and financial challenges and sort of staff challenges. We can't find the people. So uh, this sort of more with less continues to be uh, the direction that that I think many of us are being pulled apart at um, student needs, student expectations. And then also compliance and, and other things. Our, our work is more complex than it ever has been. Um, and as Krista pointed to, so many things beyond the college campus coming in through the college campus, whether it's the news or technology and social media and, and racial injustice, um, all of that uh, kind of coming in. Uh, what else would folks like to add here about what you see into the future? Well, I, one thing we didn't bring up that I you know, I, and I really almost want to pose this as a question to Carolyn and Krista, but Please. Uh, there's also, a, uh, and my sense is at least, the young staff, typically millennials, and their work ethic <laughs> and their desire to have a balance in life and leave at five o'clock and, and move on and do that, which is understandable mm -hmm. uh, versus didn't grow up with that kind of ethic. We always had this experience in student affairs where, my goodness, you might get there at eight and go home at eight or or later, and uh, mm -hmm. kind of work until the job was done. That's that's got to be a tension, I think. Uh, I'd love to have you all talk about that. I think it goes back to, and I'll definitely let Carolyn end on this one, but on the, for this question, but I think it goes back to value, right? So how are folks feeling? Uh, valued? Um, are they feeling as they're heard, um, not just listened to? Mm -hmm. uh, right. I'm not saying that some of the expectations are different, right, intergenerationally, but um, that's been my experience. It's about value and um, being heard, being respected in all of who that person is, mm -hmm. right? Um, Cared for as not just a, an employee, but as a person. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, and I think that that particularly resonates at the small college, right? I mean, we when we talk about sort of high touch, um, high impact, that's about showing the fact that we value everyone um, on our on our respective campuses, right? Mm -hmm. We value the faculty, we value the staff, um, we value the student, right? Um, and it's it's how do we it's how do we display that um, display that type of display that type of value, um, and uh, and I think that people feel as if they are more comfortable displaying that type of value um, at this at the small college uh, than 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 in other in other places. You know, Tom, you said something that I think that um, we should probably expand on a little bit uh, more. You you talked about um, um, you talked about the limitations of folks being promoted uh, at the at the small college, some of that. Um, and I think that's, you know, 
something that we should expand on because uh, we are we should be destination places to work, right? Mm -hmm. But we know that um, we have multiple roles. Um, everybody has multiple roles, and the the structure is pretty flat um, at the small college. So, are we destination or are we um, what what type of place are we with mm -hmm. limited promotion op promotional opportunities? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think just as I was mentioning with students, um, small colleges are a great place for some and not, and not a great place for some. And how do we be distinct? Um, but how do we do that with staff? Uh, if this is what you're looking for, this is a great environment you to be in. Um, and, and so uh, not trying to draw all student affairs professors small college, but what are the ways that we can help people find who who the value fit, the 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 way of working fits, the connection fits, um, so so that they stay and and they're happy and they're successful and they can continue to contribute. And I think for talking to faculty, right? So this is um, me speaking to faculty and folks who are engaging with uh, master students and doctoral mm -hmm. students, right? How much are we including examples, right? Shout mm -hmm. out to the book, but also case mm -hmm. studies and examples of small colleges and universities. Um, what does it look like? What does it feel like? How, how often are we bringing folks into the classroom, right? Who are these amazing folks who are senior student affairs officers, who are directors, right? Who are, right. and so I think introducing those folks, right? Who are going to be practitioners to some of these spaces. I have students who are like, I don't wanna go to a large public right? Mm -hmm. I want to be at a smaller institution where I can thrive and start my career. Mm -hmm. um, and so how how much are we exposing our, our students coming up to those mm -hmm. places? Mm -hmm. And what I was going to, uh, I appreciate kind of re recycling that, that question, because I think when I think about the staff at Davidson, particularly because I was there a long time, that stayed and thrived in that environment, they really believed in the mission of the place. They bought into it. They felt like they were a part of it. Um, and, and that was critically mm -hmm. important to them. Uh, so it be, and then you couple that with the importance of community. Uh, if they feel like it's a community that cares about them, that matters, um, those two things I think drive a lot of people. Yeah. Sure, could go some other place and perhaps make more money or have a greater responsibility, but they may be given up the other things that were important to them in doing so. So I, I think those are understated kinds of things that, yeah. that keep people at small colleges. I want to, I love the, the, the word you used of place. And it's reminding me of uh, a campus that I was recently working with and, and folks, a small, small college and folks talked about, I love this place, mm -hmm. which is different than I love this college or I love this campus, I love this place. And what they meant by place was the college, the campus, the town, the geographical, like they meant that whole thing. And you just used um, commitment to place. Um, does it seem like at, at small colleges, it's, a, it's about more than the campus? It's about a commitment to place, the surrounding community? And I mean, Northfield is a huge part of the Carleton experience. Absolutely. It, it's about place. I mean, particularly, you know, I will say I, you know, my family and I, we moved here from Atlanta, Georgia, right? And, 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 and you know, it's a little different. It's a little bit. It's, it's quite different. And, and finding a place was really important for us, right? It was the, can I sort of, um, uh, what is going to be my, you know, our family experience on campus, mm -hmm. right? Can my, can my, you know, kids, I have three young kids, can they feel comfortable in walking around campus? Will they be a part uh, of this community? Can they go downtown, which they do to the bike shop and the coffee shop and the, well, not the coffee shop, but the ice cream, you know, store. And I was reminded like yesterday that downtown Northfield is a little bit different one from what folks might imagine by downtown. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's, it's all walkable, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, but but that's but that's important. I think when you become a part of a small college community, it's all of the above. It's not just the, I'm just, 
you know, going to campus a couple of days to, a week to teach or an eight to five. It's about being engaged in, in the life and mind of not only the college, but the community, um, mm -hmm. the community as well. And so that's really important for the seasoned professional, but it's also important for the for the young professional because they have to buy into the community uh, right. above all. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a, you know, Keith, there's a, there are a couple of chapters um, in this book that we specifically highlight. Um, um, it talks about sort of this transition to the small college and, and you know, Paul McLaughlin, who's at Colgate, uh, talks mm -hmm. about what does it mean to be um, in a small town, um, walking into the grocery store and seeing, you know, the people that you supervise just about mm -hmm. every day, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, being at, you um, events, um, you know, you're working out and you see somebody that you um, uh, see somebody that you supervise. And so that anonymity um, mm -hmm. doesn't exist as 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 much as uh, as well. And so you got to buy into those. You have to buy into those things, too. Yeah. Great. Well, we are running out of time. And this podcast is Student Affairs Now. And we always like to end with what are you thinking about? What are you troubling? What are you pondering now? And so just like to invite each of you in. It might be related to our conversation today. It might be something that is really salient for you uh, beyond our conversation. And also if folks want to share where, where folks can connect with you. Uh, please share with them how they can do that. So so Carolyn, what is what is with you now? You know, I think what's with me now is, you know, Keith, we need reminders. Uh, and this podcast is a perfect reminder that our profession is going to be OK and, and mm -hmm. student affairs is going to be OK. High education is going to be OK. You may have the peaks and the valleys, um, but we all enter this space um, um, wanting to make a difference uh, in the lives of students. And we will continue to, to do that. And so um, we all need reminders. And this has been my daily reminder um, mm -hmm. uh, of such. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Twitter is a perfect way uh, at Carlton uh, DOS. Um, LinkedIn uh, is well as well uh, is a is a way to uh, is a way to reach out and and good old fashioned email um, mm -hmm. works uh, works too. Uh, so Carlton College um, dot edu you can you can certainly find me there. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Krista. What's with you now? Yeah, to go go off of that, right? Like I, we are going to be okay. Um, and I, I just want to throw in the conversation and, and recognize that folks are in different states um, and different states are experiencing certain types of legislation right now. Right. And so mm -hmm. I speak, speak that as well uh, in the state of Ohio. There are several uh, one in particular on the table. And no matter what happens, no matter what version of the bill passes, we're going to be OK. Um, mm -hmm. And so having community of folks and have community of folks on campuses that are still committed to doing the work, whatever the work is for you, um, we're going to be okay. I'm CJP, uh, PhD at uh, social media, Instagram and, and Twitter, and then Krista J. Porter on LinkedIn and Facebook. Of course, email. Awesome. Awesome. Tom, what, what is with you now? Well, I'm, you know, I love the word pondering. So I, you know, this and I've been pondering and thinking about, um, I felt like pre-COVID, things were pretty hot on a college campus. Um, things were, there, there was quite a bit of, of racial unrest. There was, um, there were certainly concerns about sexual assault, about LGBTQ rights and other, you know, you go down the list. COVID has suppressed all of that um, mm -hmm. and campuses. And as the campus has now reemerged, I also wonder if we got this flow of, okay, we put that aside, but it's, the issues are still there. We've got to get back to it <laughs> on one hand. And then you've got this increasingly conservative state legislatures on the other trying to diminish the rights mm -hmm. of, of many uh, that we care about, uh, whether those be students of color, whether they be reproductive rights, whether it be sexual assault issues, whether they be LGBTQ rights, uh, transgender rights. Uh, so we've got legislatures. And, and, you know, you think about small colleges, many of them, which are private, and the way we're insulated from that. But those trustees, too, <laughs> and an impact some of the things that we thought were safe. Um, so I, 
yes, student affairs is going to be fine. And we've got the talent and we've got the energy and we've got the education to be on the front lines. But I think that kind of pushback is something we haven't experienced. And, mm -hmm. and that, that's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Yeah. Right. Well, well, thanks to all three of you. When we, um, before we even launched this podcast, one of the things that we talked about is wanting to be restorative to the profession. And I think that's where we ended with some real difficult challenges um, facing our students, facing our institutions, facing our leadership, facing our, our society. And how do we find conversations like this to be restorative so that we have renewed energy to go out, uh, take on these very real challenges and navigate them as effectively as we can um, for ourselves and also for those that we serve, our students, and ultimately the society that we're a part of. So thank you all for being with us and for the conversation. Thank you for the book, uh, which is available now through uh, NASPA publication. So you can find it there and, and many other places. And I really appreciate you uh, being with us here today. This has been terrific. Thanks also to our spot. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, thanks also to our sponsor, uh, today's episode, Simplicity. Simplicity is the global leader in student services technology platforms with state-of-the-art technology that empowers institutions to make data-driven decisions specific to their goals. A true partner to the institution, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life, including but not limited to career services and development, student conduct and well-being, student success, and accessibility services. To learn more, visit simplicity.com or connect with them on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. A huge shout out to our producer, Nat Ambrosi, who does all the behind the scenes work to make us look and sound good. And we love the support for these important conversations from our community. You can help us reach even more folks by sub subscribing to the podcast on YouTube, on Apple, wherever you get your podcast, and on our weekly newsletter announcing each new episode each week. If you're inclined, you can also leave us a five-star review. It really helps expand the reach of these conversations. I'm Keith Edwards. Thanks again to our fabulous guests today and to everyone who's watching and listening. Thanks. Make it a great week. Thank you all.